Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you've given to us grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the divine trinity and in the power of the divine majesty to worship the unity. We pray keep us in this faith and evermore defend us from all adversities through your might, the one God who reigns world without end. Amen. Verse 4 of Christmas hymn 93. Sages, leave your contemplations. Brighter visions beam afar. Seek the desire of the nations. You have seen his nat natal star, natal star afar. Come and worship, come and worship. Worship Christ, the newborn king. Well, we turn our attention again to Reverend Thomas Beacon, a chaplain to Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Aquinas, not Aquinas, Thomas Cranmer at a prebendary at Cath Canterbury Cathedral. Uh, he wrote a very, very nice volume on prayers and other pieces in the Parker Society. And the thing that has impressed upon us is his fluency and command of the language that if something isn't clear, he speaks on it, and by the time you're done, the sun is shining all over the place. The night has disappeared. Occasion, he gets a little bit, to my mind, my private opinion, he does it a little bit, overdoes it. But that is a minor complaint to the much larger and beautiful uh, observation that he's a clear writer. It's just enjoyable to read. I've got a friend in, in Twiss House who uh, did some reading for somebody, public reading of Beacon's prayers, and he said it was, you know, almost ecstatic experience was the sense of his communication on that. Anyways, we have some of the early pieces of Beacon. I believe he's a Cambridge man, but we'll, we'll, we'll review that. This here was published... Uh, Thankfully, in 1843, thank God for Parker. This is uh, was brought into the collection of the University of Toronto in 1891. Uh, just about the same year my grandpa was born, just a little north of Toronto. 1891. I'm going to do a biographical notice of Beacon again, preface. Uh, and it's got the names of different uh, pieces that he wrote. Looks like about 10. <clears throat> These are early writings uh, during the reign of Henry VIII. And it, it's a very complicated period, the intersection between the efforts of the <clears throat> Henrician reformers, uh, and they break loose in the, to be the Edwardian reformers and then get wiped out. By the Marian Revolution, fortunately, the cream of the crop fled England and went to Strasbourg, Frankfurt, Zurich, Basel, Geneva, warmly received and trained and taught so that they could take solid thinking back to England. Uh, on Beacon's personal history, much less is known than from the evident popularity of his works and the estimation in which he was held by his contemporaries, we should have supposed would have recorded of him. Let's see if I can go one step bigger here. Not sure I can. Let's see. No, I'm sorry. Give me a second. Uh, besides, he has frequently been confounded with another person of the same name. Same university and sometimes represented as holding offices or preferments when in truth he was no more. <clears throat> Even the county in which he was born had been variously stated as by Norfolk and some others of Suffolk. Uh, the year of his birth must have been 1511 or 1512. Since we find his age inscribed and on the portrait which frequently accompanies his writings, for example, The Governance of Virtue, 1566, I taught the Suad, 41, Anno Domini, 1553, 
in the folio edition, Anno Aitatis Sui 49, 15, 60. It seemed probable that he lost his father early in life, for his mother had married again and became a second time a widow, as he himself informs us at the close of Henry VIII's reign. Of his elementary training, we have no account, but it appears he was 16 when he was a member of St. John's College, Cambridge, where he proceeded to his first degree in Bachelor of Arts, 1530. May be added here that he eventually graduated Doctor of Divinity. It was during his residence in the university, 1530. He's got to know what's going on with Cranmer, but he's a, he's 20 years younger than Cranmer too. But he's got to know what's been has had been going on at Cambridge and Church. Uh, we got a footnote here. The Life of Beacon appears in Lupton's History of the Modern Protestant Divines, London, 1637, Modern Protestant Divines. Ritson, ranking him with the poets of the 16th century, and I can see why. Again, his command of the language is just glorious. It was a very brief, inaccurate sketch of him. Uh... He mentions also his obligations to George Stafford, fellow of Pembroke Hall and reader of divinity, and quotes the saying, which had passed into a proverb when Master Stafford read and Master Latimer preached. Then Cambridge was blessed. Under such instructors as these, God was training up the youthful beacon for future extended usefulness. From these, he imbibed the great doctrines of gospel truth, and though at that time, even under the most zealous and enlightened divines in England, had not altogether emerged from the darkness of popish superstition. And Beacon, for several years after, still held, held various tenets, which he ultimately rejected. And there's a wonderful section in one of the other books that descri he describes his own emergence and how bad he felt about the previous tenets that he held. Same with uh, Ridley, had the same kind of emerging growth. Of the interval between graduating the arts and ordination, we have no account, but it is but a conjecture founded on his own statement that he was a poor scholar and on his known subsequent practice that he might possibly be then engaged in the instruction of youth. He was not, it seems, ordained till about the year 1538 when he was 26 or 27 for his general preface dated January 17, 1564. He speaks of himself as having been 26 years in the ministry. 26 years, 1564, 1544, 1538. Just as the six articles are coming on deck, you know that was not an easy time. His per preferment was the vicarage of Brensett or Branzet near Romney and Kent, at present a very small village and probably more insignificant three centuries ago. But his labors here in his writings, for he soon began to be an author, appears to have attracted the notice and obtained the friendship of several of the neighboring gentry, and you can see why. If they're book readers, they'd like this guy's command of the language. His earlier treatises are, was scarcely an exception, dedicated to gentlemen whose residences were in the vicinity of his cure. <laughs> About this period, it may be added, he suffered, reminds me of some of the modern stuff they put on the, you know, the back of books, and 20 guys say, hey, this is great, and then the, one of those guys writes a book. The other 19 glom on. 20 and glom on, you know, they all, it's kind of an echo chamber in the academic world, I think, and with the executives and the suites of the publishing companies, and we're thankful for them, but we're also a little watchful. We're very, very sorry about some of the developments with Jim Packer. And we saw some things with Sproul, too. It was like a money-making machine, and we, we had to turn it off. 
this guy making a million a year in the ministry? Really? When the average guy out here, you know, I think a hundred thousand is good for a family man. Maybe eighty thousand on the short side, but certainly. But a million, come on. Hundred thousand is a good salary for a good solid record. Thereabouts. Anyways, you've heard my opinions for the morning, and thank you for your indulgence. Um, Episcopalian, so we pay our men well. And uh, I hope it ever remains that way, but not not what some of these guys are doing on TV. It's godless. They're like Renaissance popes. <sighs> the times when Beacon were full of danger. He's cautious in his manner of speaking of the doctrines and ceremonies and prescribed. Now, he was doing the Sarah Missal. And we're reading through that complex, multi-volume document as we speak. And Cranmer shrunk it down to our little book of common prayer. Look at that thing. That bad boy's been around the world. <laughs> we have no exact detail of the opinions for which he was troubled and the extent to which he submitted. But we find in the list which Fox has given of persons presented in London in the year 1541, now this is when the prebendaries are trying to kill Cranmer, that Beacon and his friend Robert Wisdom, parish priest of St. Margaret's Lothbury, were brought to St. Paul's Cross to recant and revoke their doctrine and to burn their books. Again, Cranmer this time is under the gun. He's in hiding. They got a they got a big target on his back, and he's rather. And if it weren't for Henry, Tom would have gone the way of the flesh. Would have gone to the way of Robert Burns the year before, or Oliver Cromwell. They didn't hesitate to roll big heads. So he's been called up. I wonder who the bishop was who did this. Bishop Kennett fixes this recantation in the year 1542. So he does some backtracking. Miles Coverdall did the smart thing and buggy boogie it out of England. It commits worshipful audience for declaration of my penitent heart and the testifying unto you of my unfeigned conversion from error to truth. It sounds like a false, it sounds like perjury to me. I occupy this day the place of a penitent and praying you to give credit to that which I now say of myself. We don't have any respect for any of this, these false conversions. I don't think he, he meant that. And if he did and then flipped back to the reform phase, sorry, we don't buy it. Especially in the face of so many thousands of martyrs. Bail. For to him, the epistle published in the name of Henry Stelbridge is attributed, supplies some particulars. You, he says, addressing Gardner and Bonner, made Aunt Alexander's seat the most miserably to recant of your false free will. William Tolan for your holy water making, Thomas Beacon for your images, your chastity and your satisfaction. Robert Wisdom for your saints' veneration, your ceremonies of the Pope's old religion. <sighs> Let's look at some footnotes here. Wisdom was one of the persons recommended on the deprivation of Archbishop Dowdell in 1551 by Cranmer for the See of Armagh. He was afterwards Archdeacon of Eli. He was the author of the old version of Psalm 125 and of the hymns of join, preserve us, Lord, by thy dear word. The submission did not secure him from future danger and finding the metropolis and its precincts no safe residence, he retired into the country. When neither by speaking nor by writing I could do good, I thought it best, says he, and the jewel of joy, not rashly to throw myself into the ravening paws of these greedy wolves. That's, that's a smart move. And Jesus says, when they're coming after you, flee. So you can return another day to fight on a better day. And even Jeremiah uh, counseled submission to Babylon without giving up your faith. And Ezekiel 
but for a certain space to absent myself, absent myself from their tyranny, according to the doctrine of the gospel, bidding farewell, therefore, to his mother and his other friends. Beacon repaired first to the peak of Derbyshire, intending to support himself by pupils. He was a stranger in this part of the kingdom and had no reason to expect a welcome in a region then regarded as most rude and uncivilized and where it appears popish superstition at the time generally prevailed, what about else would, would prevail? I mean, they were all using the Sarah missile. The poor people in the pew who always work and love, defend, fight for the pew, the people. It's rude and uncivilized. The farmers. What crude language and condescending language is uncivilized? The people, the farmer over here got like, thousand acres. Is he literate? No. Is he intelligent? Absolutely. Has he got a lot of money? Absolutely. But is he literate? No. Is he civilized? Of course he is. He's a real gentleman, really kind. So I resent this kind of condescending um, caste-based language. I really resent it because my great-grandparents were all farm people. Yeah. They attend a nice, beautiful Episcopal Church, Anglican Church of Canada. That's where they were baptized, married, and buried. Were they literate in Oxford Duns? Simple people. Crude backwoods woodsmen, that's just... Whoever wrote this, this is crap. We get the... We get the good stuff out and leave the bad behind. Let's move on. But that God who leads his people safely by a way they know soon raised him up friends and introduced him to those who were brethren in his faith. And we're still interested in the role of Lollardy and Wycliffeitism in this period. Nobody ever seems to comment on that. Coming into a little village called Alsop in the Dale, he met there a gentleman bearing the name Alsop, a proprietor of the place, a man both advanced in years and ripe in Christian character. This beacon soon discovered him. For on their first acquaintance, Mr. Alsop showed him his library. I thought he was a big, rude and uncivilized backwoodsman, where he said were his choicest treasures. Among those books <coughs> with the scriptures of Coverdale's translation <coughs> with several works of the reformed writers including all the treatises that Beacon himself put forth under the name of Basel the man who prized these volumes must be like-minded with their author and doubtless the true enjoyed delightful intercourse while in the peak Beacon learned that Robert Will's wisdom was in Staffordshire. He forthwith resolved him to join him. They had two together stood in peril and persecution, and it would be pleasant to meet in comparative safety. It was in the house of John Old, a faithful brother, that wisdom was, and with equal hospitality and goodwill did entertain Old, Be old entertain Beacon. But in a short time, wisdom was called away by urgent letters, and the friends parted with tears. Beacon remained in Staffordshire upwards of 12 months, again occupied in the instruction of youth. In his labors, he had every reason to believe in endeavoring to implant in their breasts of the true gospel. This was not in vain. The people here were somewhat less superstitious than Derbyshire, Though the priests savor generally little or nothing of scripture truth. And that's, we wonder, we're, we're, we're going to get into the serum missile ourselves so that we don't end up with historical exaggerations. The serum missile is covered with all kinds of errors, but it's got all kinds of good stuff in it too. Um, so we're going to have to factor in this hagiography that we're getting and temper and nuance it by a cleaner narrative. Beacon afterwards were removed into Warwickshire 
where he was again employed as a tutor to gentlemen's sons and again participated in the hospitality of John Holt, who was now a resident in this country. In Warwickshire, the happiest hours of his retirement were spent in other parts besides the counties mentioned. He was in Leicestershire, where he met his countryman, John Aylmer, afterwards Bishop of London, living as tutor in the family of the Marquis of Dorset. In other parts, he found a few friends. But in Warwickshire, he had the friendly acquaintance of many learned and pious men. While he was in their company, methought, he says, I was clean delivered from Egypt and quietly placed in the new Jerusalem, which is described in Revelation of the Blessed John. <laughs> Among these worthies with whom Beaking had special cause warmer, one from whose lips he had long learned the lessons of eternal wisdom, it was the venerable Hugh Latimer. A, never, a name never to be mentioned without affectionate reverence, we agree. The meeting under such circumstances between the aged teacher, eh, well, I guess 25 years older maybe than young Tom Beacon, and the more youthful this disciple must have had a peculiar interest. And there's something to be said about that. Us older guys with the younger guys coming along were hungry and thirsty and pious and devout and got questions. There's a certain dynamic that's beautiful. I say that as an older mentor to some guys. Latimer might now see the fruit of his earlier labors, and he doubtless blessed God for it and was encouraged to tread more strenuously that course, which was afterwards gloriously terminated by the martyr's crown. While in Warwickshire, Beacon received the unexpected news of the death of his stepfather. He felt it therefore his duty and his friends around him fully approved of his determination to return to his native country in order to comfort his widowed mother, now for the second time a widow. In addition to the tutorial employment already noticed, he had not been idle with his pen during a stay in the Midland counties. Several treatises he had composed, of which the governance of virtue was one, written, as he says in the preface to it, in the bloody, boisterous, burning time, when the reading of the Holy Bible, word of our soul's health, was forbidden to poor lay people which Tom Cranmer had to go along with, but that was Henry's game. He put them in the churches, said you could all read it, and then he later backtracked and said, no, it's off limits to the layman, except certain socioeconomic class could read it. He had also translated a few works from Latin into English. Some of these productions he ventured from retirement to put forth in print, though still under the assumed name at Basel. The rest he reserved till more favorable opportunity should present itself. He incurred, indeed, no slight risk in publishing at all. All this time for his works were included in a proclamation dated July, 14, July 8, 1546, against the so-called heretical books. The accession of King Edward VI opened the beacon both personal security and a wider field of usefulness. He was instituted March 24, 1547, to the rectory of St. Stephen Walbrook, in the presentation of Grocer's Company. He was also made by Archbishop, to whom he was chaplain, one of the six preachers in Canterbury Cathedral. Oh, my word. If we think he's preaching the way he writes... Man, there was some heat going through the nave of that chapel. Heat in a good way, not elevated emotionalism, but intelligent, brilliant, illuminatory rays. Oh, my word. Thomas Beacon at Canterbury Cathedral. Man, the pigeons and the towers would hear him preaching and fly off. He's, he's that good with the language. And Cranmer, who has an eye for theological talent, didn't make a mistake. Oh, I forget who else was a prebendary. 
Canterbury. I'm drawing a blank. There's some other guys that I made it up. But there's reasonable ground for believing that it was at this period, much prior to that time, at which we are now arrived. For in his book of matrimony, which relating a conversation, he remembered which took place at the archbishop's table on the lawfulness of priest's marriage. He calls him that glorious martyr of Christ, but now a most glorious saint in heaven. Sometime my Lord and master and most beneficial patron, maintainer of my studies, not only of my studious travails, but also of many other. These words, coupled with the fact of Beacon's earlier residence in Kent, may with some kind of probability be taken to indicate that he had Cranmer's countenance at a time right when he was preparing future labors, that when almost arrived at middle life, he was actually engaged in those labors. The discussion referred to may be supposed to have occurred early in King Edward's reign when the subject came formally before the convocation. Beacon dedicated his treatise of fast, fasting, which is printed in the second part of his collected works, to Archbishop Cranmer. In the preface, he speaks gratefully of the kindness he received. He does not enumerate them, but he describes them as the manifold benefits which he had bountifully bestowed upon me. Strip, it may be added, calls him a man well known to the Archbishop. Beacon was also now chaplain to the protector, Duke of Somerset, and seems to have been for some time an intimate or an inmate in his family at Sheen during the Duke's imprisonment in 1549. Daily prayers were offered him by his household, and when at length, 1550, February 6th, he was set at liberty, there was a form of thanksgiving for his grace's deliverance views, which was gathered, we are told, and set forth by Thomas Beacon, minister of others, minister there. A footnote here, the other five are stated to have been Nicholas Ridley, afterwards Bishop of London, a martyr, Lancelot Ridley, I'm sure who that is. Now, there's a Robert Redley up at Cambridge who Cranmer liked. is different from Nicholas. Rip Richard Beasley and John Joseph. Um, okay, that's probably where we should stop this session. <clears throat> Verse 5 of hymn 93. Saints before the altar bending, watching long in hope and fear. Suddenly the Lord descending in his temple shall appear. Come and worship, come and worship. Worship Christ, the newborn king. Let's pray. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive honor, glory, power, riches, wisdom, strength, and honor. And all blessings.